has organized uh, this great event for us um, with Dr. John Mayer. So uh, we're hopeful that this is a first in several that we'll eventually be doing over the, the next few years. And so when you see how great this is going to be, of course, you're going to bring all your friends the next time. Uh, make sure you chalk it up so that we uh, just keep building this uh, great uh, strength in our care group that helps support the work that we're doing in the building. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Mayer for uh, about the last 10 years. Um, when I was a uh, principal at Bishop Mill Institute of Hammond, uh, we worked with him. He came in to speak with our students and parents. I uh, had very positive reactions uh, to the work that he did with them. And uh, when I was working with our high school uh, PA representative, I uh, mentioned his name as a possibility for some of the things that we've been working with, uh, with our kids and trying to help them make good choices. So I do want to uh, specifically recognize the high school team members. We have three of them here. Uh, Nyla Barnes, who I just waved, uh, Deborah Weiner, uh, Kate Surmeyer, and then Annette Bacola is not here this evening, but she's also been part of that planning as well. Oh, we can do that. So Dr. John Ayer is a practicing clinical psychologist who specializes in helping families attain healthy and happy lifestyles. He received his doctorate from Northwestern University Medical School. He's a nationally and internationally known clinician, author, lecturer, who frequently appears in the media addressing topics of critical concern in society, particularly noted for his successful work with the dreaded difficult age group, teenagers. Uh, Mayor's memo, his newsletter sent to schools and institutions across the U.S., is in its 25th year and is acclaimed for its hard-hitting guidance on the timely concerns about you. Dr. Mayer is noted for his to-the-point, doable solutions to life's most challenging obstacles. He is the author of 20 books, most of them concerning family issues. His latest book is the second edition of his acclaimed family lifestyle book, Family Fit. His extremely helpful book list. <laughs> Of course. Uh, his extremely helpful booklets, the Parents Mini Manual Series, can be seen and are available at a website by, run by moms, uh, www.nogginpower2.com, which I'm sure you're going to have fun with. Um, his first novel, uh, Shadow Warrior, is currently being made into a Hollywood motion picture. Uh, John is a native Chicagoan, a parent, and a Hyde Park resident. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. John Mayer. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I don't think I need a mic either. And uh, I might be the one of the only speakers that comes to bringing gifts. I hope. So a lot of you take some of my little mini manuals out there. There's probably a couple more left. You get more online. I'll give that information at the end of the uh, presentation. And I have a couple of books. This literally are my copies from the publisher. It just came to me about a week ago. So these are the only two books I have on family fit. And during the question and answer period, we can talk about it a little bit. So I, you know what? You were the first one for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody else uh, would have wanted to and I have three copies of mine. This is going to be made. To, actually, the producer director is scouting locations in New York right now. It's, it's, a, it's a good book. It's about uh, the drug problem. And I, for years, as a scientist and an uh, academician, published things in journals. And, and in 2005, I said, how am I going to reach a larger audience? And I published, I wrote and published uh, Shadow Board. And it's really sort of the inside story of the drug problem. And kids have loved it. One of the schools around here, in fact, Mount Carmel, has it in this library. And one of the young men did a great review for their student newspaper. It's very readable. Parents, it's got a little bit of a saucy scene there, too, in it. But, you know, you have to do that for Hollywood. So, anybody? <laughs> they are available, so. <laughs> so, my gifts to you. You start in the Hollywood production. Well, they wanted Chris Pine, but Chris Pine then got off into this Star Trek thing. The, the director's first movie was Chris Pine's first movie. And now he's Mr. Star Trek, or what, Captain Kirk? So they're looking to see. Uh, we don't have the I've got Star Trek. So we can talk after. You'd be the guy, you look exactly like I picture the hero. So uh, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> but let's get into our topic here tonight. And 
we have reserved plenty of time for question and answers. And that's so important to me as a speaker. As Scott mentioned, I speak all around the country and all around the world. I just did a keynote presentation at a university in Mexico. And for me as a speaker, the most important thing is to give to you tonight. I'm going to present some material that I think is cutting edge, is important to know about teenagers. But what's most important for me tonight, you came here tonight to get something. It's your job to get something out of this presentation. Take one thing home that you can use with your kids tonight. Please do that. Whether it comes in my presentation, or again, we'll reserve plenty of time for a question and answer time. You can ask me anything you want. We can talk about working with Hollywood, anything. Uh, I'm also, you might know, when I speak to your students on uh, the 14th. And I'm excited about that. Actually, a couple of students have emailed me already, and I'm in dialogue with them. And I think it's going to be very good for the students, because the, the first email I got was, you're not going to do the same old thing that all these speakers do, are you? And I said, well, tell me what I can do differently. And I got some great, great information to give to them. And I think a good presentation. So uh, I'd be very curious as to what they say when they get home after that presentation. So you'll see my email all over the place. You can always communicate with me. I'm very good about communication. So let's talk about this topic tonight. Inside the mind of teenagers. It's something I've devoted my entire professional career to. So I'm going to present from my perspective as not only a clinician, but a scientist and a researcher. researcher. I'm a parent myself. I've been through these years, and my children are not the typical shrinks children, I can say. They're great, well-adjusted uh, young people. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very proud of them. And quite honestly, one of my first messages tonight, they're literally my best friend. I can say that. It's so cool that they are my best friend. Uh, and I want to share those kind of tips with you tonight. I want to start with two important facts, not only in my research, but in my clinical work. These young people today are amazingly skilled and talented, amazingly so. I admire them so much at what they can do. But the second fact is just as remarkable. They are more immature than past generations. Any professional will tell you that second fact is very, very true. That doesn't negate the first fact, nor diminish our teenagers. I think they're wonderful, the vast, vast majority of them. But the fact is that they are less mature than any generation before them. And I will tell you that the generations coming up seem to be following that trend. It's just something we have to deal with. And I can talk more about that, not only as we go on, but again in the question and answer period. Our children are mature. They need guidance. They need structure. They need boundaries. And I'm going to talk about that path a little tonight and how you can set that. So let's talk a little bit about it. The first thing we're going to talk about is responsibility development. This should be a very, very, welcome discussion because we would all like our kids to be more responsible and we would like them to do what we want them to do. So let's talk how we do that. I'm going to show you tools by which you can get your kids to be more responsible. Here's the first tool, naming. Very important to use the word responsibility around the house around school. Otherwise, they don't know what it is. They don't have a concept. And particularly in this school, these kids are very, very smart and, and have a good command of language. They need to hear the word responsible. And could you do this responsibility? Very important to name things. It's very important to name emotions when you talk about emotions in the family. It's very important to talk about personality traits. But here when we talk about responsibility, it's very important to talk about the word 
I want you to take this responsibility. Second, share the road. Like naming, be very, very clear on how a team can get more responsibility, obtain more responsibility. Here's what you have to do in order to do this. Sometimes we parents keep obtaining responsibility, like driving, uh, going to the formal, uh, whatever it may be. We keep it obtuse, vague. Well, when you're ready, what does that mean? Break it down into the steps that you need to see as a parent for them to take this responsibility. Very, very important. See, that's that concept of structure. It's that concept of setting a boundary for them. Here's what you need to do, and then I can grant you that responsibility. And again, naming that word, responsibility. Very, very important. Be active with your team in the responsibility. This is a huge adult mistake about granting responsibility. We don't observe them. We tell them to go off and do something, we give them a responsibility, and then we're, we're not even watching what they do, especially when we first grant responsibilities for the first time. We don't watch them, we don't know how they're handling. Keep in mind that handling responsibility is new for the team. How can we expect them to succeed unless we give them the step by step instruction? Unless we orientate them to the responsibility. I overheard conversations as I arrived here today about the formal dance that was Saturday and how well it went. I also overheard some of the faculty talking about the fact that the students were informed. They were given instructions about the dance. They were told what was going to happen. They had a framework in which to perform in this responsibility. A formal dance is new to these young people. They haven't done it before. Some schools have proms. I don't know if you have a prom, but many schools have proms. And when I talk to schools about uh, pre-prom instruction for parents, they often talk about how many times have these kids done this? How will they know how to behave unless we spell it out for them? We let them know our expectations. I think you did that at the formal dance. And voila, what happens? A good experience. As I overheard these conversations, I saw people smiling and saying, it was a good experience. It was really, really worthwhile. It's because we, you took those steps that I'm going to point out and structure for you tonight. These responsibilities are new for your children. Point it out. Here's a big one. I can't tell you how many times as a clinician in my office that when problem families come to seek my help, it's because there's a huge conflict between the expectations of parents and the abilities and the information of our children. Our expectations are up here, and what our children have been informed about or can handle is about here. So it's a huge area of conflict. And then what happens? Clash. Just clash between the generations. So we're going to talk about watching your expectations. Modeling. I'm going to start over here. The more I am a clinical psychologist, the more this old adage seems to apply that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I have a great vignette to tell you. I'll never forget when I first started to practice, I had a, a dad come in and bring his son to my office. And the dad was just railing on this young man. And I want you to change this, and I want you to fix this, and I want you to fix that, and, and this is what I want different. And the whole time he was sitting there, he had a white shirt on with a pack of marbles in his shirt pocket. And 
the last thing he said was, and one more thing, get him to stop smoking. It literally was like, get him to stop smoking with his chest popping out. And I said, sir, I can stand on my head and wiggle my toes and stick my tongue out, and I'm never going to get him to stop smoking because look at that right there. It was almost like a Marlboro ad sticking out from his chest. I said, how am I going to get him to stop smoking when you're a smoker and you're probably smoking in front of him? You're modeling something that you don't like in your child. We're not going to call anybody out here tonight in this presentation. But I hope I can get you to think about some of the behaviors you're doing that you might be modeling with your children about responsibility. And when I talk about motivation, we cannot expect our children to be responsible when we demonstrate lack of accountability. Think about how many times you put off things when you're modeling them. Think how many times you might avoid the call from somebody who's looking for you or holding you responsible for something. Need I say a bill collector or, or whatever? And you go, oh, you know, uh, uh, tell, them I, tell them I'm not here or whatever. Our children look at us with our eyes. They're absolutely taking all our behaviors in. How can we expect our children responsible. Like the Marlboro man I just described, how can we expect them to be responsible when we're not modeling those things in front of them? Very important concept about modeling. Rewarding. Rewards are an enormous, enormous aid for us in building responsibility. When your child, I'm going to pause a second. Notice I said child. They're children. They may be 16 years of age, 17 years of age, look us straight in the eye, but they're on finished process. It helps me a great deal in my work with young people to understand that they're still children in some respects. And they're still, as I said to you as we were talking when you first came in, bumping into the furniture a bit. I expect that out of them so if they're not going to do everything perfectly, and I'll talk about that. Rewarding them is very important. Studies have shown that adult and adult going up to a child and saying eye to eye, I'm awful proud of you is more powerful than handing them money, giving them treats, giving them tickets to something, a tangible reward. Study after study shows us that the power we have as adults, more than a friend coming up and saying the same thing, they are looking to us and hungry for us to say, I'm proud of you. That's the best reward we can give you. And reward effort. Very important. Very important. Follow the second. When we reward the accomplishment, the accomplishment could be rewarding native ability. Could be rewarding their native brain power. When we, we reward effort, we're instilling a work ethic and responsibility that builds them up. So many of our children can accomplish schoolwork, tasks, building things, doing something on a computer. And that may be their native ability. When we reward effort, it builds responsibility. It builds character. The question and answer talk more about that. 
I will say, it's a little tongue in cheek, that typically we define a perfect accomplishment of responsibility, of a responsibility when they did something exactly like we would have done. <laughs> and that's another mistake we often make. We often expect our children to perform in life exactly how we would do it. And they're not going to do that all the time. In fact, it's the rare occasion that they're going to do something exactly the way we did it. We want to reward the effort. My favorite example here may apply more to younger kids, but I love this example. You're sitting on the Lazy Boy Sunday night, it's 9.30 at night, and your child bounces down the stairs, comes into your living room, settling back to watch your favorite TV, you're getting ready for your work week the next day. Mom, Dad, I need a piece of chartreuse poster board because Mr. Smith gave me this assignment and I have to have it by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Going, what? We must have passed a thousand Walgreens drug stores all weekend long, and you're coming at 9:30 at night and asking me to get you this chartreuse poster board so you can do your homework at 9:30 on a Sunday night. And you get aggravated, and you get, you know, you get. Uh, we don't have expectations back here, you know. Those expectations. Our expectation was that if that was me, I would have. Friday, I've been thinking, I better get that poster board before Sunday so I can do my homework. They're not going to do that. They are not going to do that. Because once 2.35 hits on Friday, lab school is a thousand miles away till Monday morning. So they're not thinking of the assignment they have for Mr. Smith necessarily. So they're not going to perform the way you would expect them or like them to perform. It's a teaching moment. So the answer is, you go to the church. And then you talk about the lesson learned. I have a little chart I made. And it was for this presentation. I call it the reward consequence effort accomplishment continuum. more the effort towards 100%, the bigger your reward. Less effort, smaller the reward. And then I have what I call the half-hearted effort. So about 50% effort. And now we start with consequences. There's got to be consequences when you are not performing. So smaller consequences as you're showing a little more effort, and bigger consequences we used to call this punishment. Bigger consequences as you're showing less effort. Very simple equation to follow as a parent. More effort you see, big huge reward. Goes down. Half-hearted effort, boom. You have consequences. Think about the practicality of that. Missing homework assignments. Gotta have consequences. Can't go out this weekend. So the, the continuum falls. Everything's going fine. Why not? Mom, Dad, can I go out this weekend? Why not? You've done everything. You put in the effort all week long to be responsible. Reward that responsibility. <coughs> Show them that their efforts are rewarded. Very simple continuum. Rewards are not bribes. Bribes don't work. They simply don't work. Bribes are promised prior to the performance of responsibility. If you do this, I'll make sure this happens. Or I'll give you this. Or this can happen. You're not building internally responsibility by a bribe. You are by a reward. When you, we reward responsible behavior, then it 
locks in that worked. I'm going to do this again. And I did it. My motivation, my effort was internal. It was something I wanted to do. And look at how my society, my parents reward that. Good job. And uh, by the way, like I said, bribes just don't work. We've proven not to work. And like I said before, by the way, number two, the best rewards you can is simply your praise, your joy, your contact with your child. This is my personal favorite tool or step in this whole process. If you remember back to high school chemistry class, we all were in that chemistry lab and we had our little pipettes and we were mixing chemicals into the beakers. And the process was called titration. We titrated chemicals, if you recall. Put some chemicals in there, mix up the beaker. If it didn't blow up the chemistry lab, we kind of put some more in until whatever the instructor wanted us to make and create, voila, it worked. That's the process called titration. The same exact process is very important with your child. You do not give big responsibilities willy-nilly all at once, or without any steps, without any preparation, without some of the other tools I talked about. You titrate. If you let them try a little bit of the responsibility, if it works, if that chemical doesn't blow up in your face, then you can give them a little more. You can add a little more. And add a little more, and add a little more. Oh, that quite didn't mix well. I'm going to take a little bit. Titration, very important process in developing responsibility in your teenager. It's some people can call this establishing boundaries. Mix a little, see if that works. Step back, let them go. If it works, get a little more. And conversely, if it isn't working, take it away. Titration, very important process in responsibility. This is how we develop responsibility. These are the tools that we know in my field that help you develop responsible children. I'm going to move now to motivation. Another huge topic. Another huge topic in schools for parents. How do I get my children, how do I motivate them? How do I get them to act? And I'm going to again give you some tools. What you can do at home. Everything starts with attitude, attitude, attitude. All our motivation techniques start with us. How we are approaching our children. There's no way you're going to inspire, motivate, energize, your child, if you don't exude those qualities yourself. It just doesn't happen. It's like Mr. Marlboro. You know, like I said, sir, with all due respect, I can stand on my head and do whatever I want to your son, but I'm not going to get him to do anything unless you copy that attitude as well. Affirmations. Affirmations, ladies and gentlemen, work, and they work very powerful. What are affirmations? It's not a good representative sample here tonight. Nobody's bringing a company logo or a ball cap or anything like that that I can point out in the audience. But those are all affirmations. Maybe somebody's got, anybody got a company pen or something? You know what they There you go. Why do you think big business does that? Why do you sports teams do that? Why even do our schools do it? Because they work. No business would spend millions of dollars on affirmative clothing, rewards, logos, if they didn't get to us unconsciously. The same process can work with the teenager. Fill your home with educational affirmations, lab school affirmations. Mr. Fetch is going to love this next statement. Buy all that lab school tchotchke from the bookstore you can. Wear those sweatpants all over. The 
those sweatshirts, whatever pins they're selling, you surround your child with those affirmations. Why? First of all, it integrates your home into the school. They see that you're invested, that you're pleased, that you're excited, that you're motivated by what they're doing at the lab school. It works very powerful. And I'll tell you about a case in a second that is really brings to life. Affirmations, affirmations, affirmations. So much so. Let me tell you a story. School sent me a young man. Make note of the dates. It was about the end of March, senior year of high school. This young man was failing terribly, and they were afraid he, he was not going to graduate. End of March. School ends in May, approximately. And this, this boy was on a uh, you know, life support system, so to speak, of, of graduates. And just not motivated, not you know, invested in school, had checked out, had senioritis with a capital S. And I came up with a system that worked marvelously. What I did, now he did want to graduate. He professed he wanted to graduate. But he didn't know how. He didn't know how to get himself mobilized and motivated. So I said the following thing. I said, you know, when your eyes open up in the morning, what's the first thing you see? What are you talking about? What? 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 Well, you know, when your eye opens up in the morning, when you get up, what's the first thing you gaze at? Oh, my mom's got this old dresser she put in my room, and there's a mirror there. It's a big mirror. And I look, and I look at myself, and I say, oh, I don't want to go to school. And I go back to bed. I told him the following thing. I want you to take a crayon or mom's lipstick or whatever. You really want to graduate school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't get there. Now, I want you to write the name of your school, big and bold, right across that mirror. So the very first thing that your eyes gaze at in the morning is your school name. And it reminds you you have to get mobilized. Now, it sounds silly. It sounds simple. But when the boy did it, he said at first he kind of scribbled the name of the school on the And it did make him think, man, I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta get going. I gotta get to school. He said by the time he graduated, when he graduated, he didn't miss another day of school. He had big and bold across this mirror the name of the school. He even had kind of, it was almost like, uh, Calligraphy. He had written the name of the school. He just erased it every couple days and made it bigger and bolder. And it was an a powerful affirmation to remind him of what the goal was. And for him, the goal was simply get his butt into school. And it worked. Affirmations work. Use them liberally. Do silly things sometimes for your kids. When they were in elementary school, you remember putting the little note in their lunch pail and all these kinds of things? It still works with high schoolers. They may look at it and go, it's getting into that knock-on voice, knock-on power. Talk the talk. Very important to talk motivationally. Be energetic. It's like we talked about responsibility. You're modeling a certain style. Also, notice I put be a team player. Be a team player at home, be a team player at school. And that's what I mean by it. One of the mistakes we make as adults is the following scenario. Snowy outside, it's cold. Everybody gets up in the household. Monday morning, it's after the Super Bowl. You might have stayed up a little late last night. Oh, Mr. Fetch didn't call off school today. Get all that snow going on. Oh, it's cold. They didn't call school. You got to go. Look at that adult man. What are you conveying to those owl eyes? That school's a negative. Oh, you got to go. They didn't call it off today. Notice 
notice how sometimes we talk and convey messages to our teens that are exactly the opposite of how we want to pep them up? Think of all the messages like that that you convey to your teenager. Oh, oh wow, it's uh, Valentine's Day, you got school today, isn't it a holiday? Super Monday, isn't it a holiday? You gotta go. Uh, I got off. What do you think message is getting? Oh, wow, this is drudgery. Wow. Instead of, oh, you got school. Oh, you know, I bet you it's gonna be. I bet you it's gonna be a lot of fun. Everybody's gonna come in and tell them the stories about the Super Bowl. They're gonna, you know, what they did. You're gonna, you're gonna have a great time. One thing I'm proud of myself as a parent that I did, talk and talk, I would have to drive my children to school every morning. It was my job. My wife picked them up. I always dropped them off saying the following phrase throughout the entire school years. Have fun. And simply, they'd open the car door, and I said, hey, have a good time. Have a good time. All I said, but look at the mindset that it creates in the child. It sets a whole different mindset of motivation. School's fun. This is big. And it takes maybe a whole other night to truly explain. And it's a mistake a lot of schools make. Use age-appropriate ones. <coughs> We know so much about the developmental path of teenagers now. When I first started, I was talking to uh, Mr. Fetch about this when we started talking about this presentation. When I first started in this field over 25 years ago, working with teenagers, the common idiom in my field was a teenager's brain is set and done and it's Created and that's it. You're, you're all set. You're done. You got your adult brain. We know now, and again, maybe fodder for another presentation one night. We know now, through studies of the human brain with MRIs, etc., I can show you in another presentation MRI slides of an adolescent's brain. We know they don't think like us adults. We know the brain isn't fully activated in the teenage years. And it really comes to play here. You cannot motivate. You cannot get your child responsible. You cannot set boundaries unless they're age appropriate. So many of our teenagers are still in the me orientation of life. It's all about me. And they don't think about we. So when you use motivations, or rewards or consequences that speak to, well, it's for the good of mankind, it's for society, it's for high Park, etc. Those fall on deaf ears many, many times because they're not there yet. Their mind is not cognitively developed yet to think of the larger picture. It's the same thing with forward thinking. Remember at the very beginning of my presentation, this generation is more immature than other generations. A hallmark of immaturity, not thinking ahead, not thinking forward. You can take an eighth grader, seventh grader, maybe even a freshman in high school, and you can talk about Harvard all you want. I know. Get those straight A's because you're going to get into an Ivy League school. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And you are talking to you know, the wall. Because senior year in college application is light years away for these children. They don't think It's a developmental facts. You must model motivation. They are watching us. They watch us all the time. They may look like all they're involved in is the latest fad in society, the latest reality show, but they are looking to adults for guidance. And they watch how you walk through the world. 
you need to watch how you walk through the door. Assess after tonight's presentation, how am I presenting motivation, responsibility? How am I interfacing with the school? Am I being a helicopter parent? Am I keeping them from responsibility? Am I blocking them from their motivation? Or am I letting them face what they need to face at the lab school? We talked about this with responsibility, and here it is again. Praise effort. And praise it effusively. You really tried. You did a great job. I'll never forget a true story. My son was a freshman in high school. Never had gotten anything below a B or a C in his educational career. I came home late from the office one night. He was also, he's also kind of a little tough guy. I don't think I saw him cry since he was a little baby. And he was sitting yoga style on the living room floor, and he had watery eyes and tears coming. And I said, what's wrong? I failed in that. One of those decision points as a parent, what do you do? He was crushed. He had failed the math test freshman year, probably first semester. It was high school, big important. I sat down next to him, also Indian style, which came at a little bit of a cost. Uh, I said, okay, let's figure out what we can do better. That's talking about effort. That's talking about talk. That's motivated. Is what can we do better? Smile on your face, getting down, tired. I was tired. I had made it all day. What can I do? What can we do? Let's figure this out. It don't crush it. Which brings me to don't confuse the lack of motivation, the lack of ability. This is a tough one, parents. Again, I'm a parent. Are they trying their best? Or is this something they just can't get? Do they have a deficit in this area? Is this a subject? Is this a task? Is this a social accomplishment that they just don't have the skills for? So we keep trying to push them the proverbial square peg and round hole. Try to keep push them into that slot. We might not have the ability to do. We have to be honest as parents and assess: Are they trying? Which we reward. Do they just don't have the ability? Again, the emphasis is on that. We've talked about this with responsibility. We've wow. talked about it several times. It's the next one. The best, best. Motivated, reward, consequence is our word of praise. Google it. You'll see countless studies saying it's the number one way we can reward our children. This is what I was heading to. We need to keep our standards high. I want you to go to the, the best college and university you can possibly go to but we have to watch our expectations. Like my son sitting on the living room floor, young people are going to fail. They're going to fail. It's life. This is all new to them. How many times have they gone to lab school? Nobody raised their hand. This is all new to them. They're not going to do it perfect. They're not going to handle it like us. We've talked about that before to really watch our expectations for the young people. And they're not finished products. They're not going to perform like we do. Some references for you to take a look at. This is really good. It's hot off the press. I really invite you to take a look at it. How children succeed. Grit, curiosity, Hidden Power of Character, 2012. This I just stumbled on on <laughs> January 29th. The Atlantic Monthly has a, uh, a mobile feed that 
comes out. And so why, the article is, why parents need to let their children fail. Really informative article on some of the things they talk about. Who wants the child to fail? That's not the message tonight. But the message is how we cope with these kids internally. They are going to fail. It's not the end of the world. We've all heard that old adage that it's sometimes through our failures where we learn the most. And when I talk to your children on the 14th, I'm not going to talk to them about failure. Like I got some really fun surprises. I'm not going to talk this way to them at all. This is for you. It's a way we cope with raising our kids. So don't get the wrong message when you're presenting this. I think it's really an interesting perspective to think about in setting your own boundaries with your children. That it's not going to be the end of the world if they struggle with it. If you miss a lot of what I'm saying tonight, for the very first time ever, I'm kind of excited about this. I'm putting on a webinar talking about these two topics. It's going to be uh, February, Monday, February 25th. Uh, I think if you look at my website, it's on there. You don't have to scoop all that stuff down. But, uh, and I'll have question and answer time on that webinar as well. It's so exciting to live in today's world where we can reach throughout the entire country and talk about these issues. And um, so that's something for you. And that's who I am. And this is another thing that I'm doing, which uh, just getting off the ground, it's not up yet. But we're talking about getting that website together, which is very inter interactive, so that like evenings like this, we wouldn't have to come out in the cold and, and have these kinds of presentations. And I'm uh, doing a lot of presentations and putting them online and having interaction with parents across the country and maybe across the world. So a couple of things that we do. I'm going to open up for questions now. I think we're doing pretty good on time, almost exactly what we, we talked about. So we have plenty of time for questions. You can ask me anything I talked about. One of the forms, by the way, one of the handouts is feedback. And I sincerely mean this. I'm always trying to improve my presentations and what I give to audiences. So if you have, uh, you have some thoughts about how I can make this better or something else you might need, please scribble some notes down. I'm, I'm glad to do it anonymously, leave it on the table. So let me open up with some questions. Yes, sir. What are the messages that you're going to be giving the kids when you talk to them next week? Well, I get a whole different thing planned. And uh, I think I uh, whispered to Mr. Fetch about this. Um, a couple of students heard that I was coming, and they emailed me. I had about five, six students email me separately. It wasn't like a, a team. And they all said the same thing. You're not going to give the same old presentation we always give, are you? And it had me thinking of what to do. So I emailed them back, and I said, what do you want to hear? I said, look up on my website, and what do you want to hear from me? I've got some experience on some topics. What do you want to hear? And four out of the six came back and said, we want you to talk about drug abuse. Drinking and drug abuse in our world. But not from the typical, you know, you better not do this, and it's going to ruin your life. And they don't know that that's my very presentation with young people. I don't talk about drug abuse way of you know, pointing a finger at them. Like, you're going to ruin your life. Or it's, you're, you're ruining your kidneys by doing it. I talk about the larger social perspective. That's what Shadow War is. Not about our kids are going to be drug addicts by experimenting with drugs. What do they mess up in their life at that time? So I'm going to probably try. I don't have it completely planned, but it's going to take that thing with school's permission, of course. I have to pass the file. Don't look forward. Uh, have no forward perspective. Our 
are still in a new orientation of life, of, of cognitive and developmental uh, uh, advance. Uh, emotionally immature, they, um, they often emotionally react to life more like a child than they do like an adult. Um, things like that. I think the problem with our kids is the environment we put it into their too focused. There's a lot of pressure on our kids. A lot of pressure. But sometimes that's that's a facade. They'll they'll mimic exactly what we want to hear from them. You know, they'll they'll go, yep, yep, I'm on board. I'm on board. But they're just responding to the pressure. Internally, they don't know how to handle it. They don't know what the steps are. Um, so that's the dynamic that often occurs. So you see them kind of repeating after you that, oh yeah, oh yeah, mom, dad, I'm there, I'm boom. But that's sometimes a pressure. Our kids today are under a lot of pressure. I will say though, I will say this, because this is another thing the media always asks me. No, oh, are kids that much different than they were 50 years ago? We have pressures too. We have different pressures. These kids have pressures. We have pressures. But they're, they're just modern pressures for these kids. And one of the pressures is this, you know, you gotta succeed, you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta get here. Not that we shouldn't be doing that. What, what did we say before? Hey, that was one of the disconnects. So standard time. Here's where here's where I'm aiming for. But internally, this is more external. I want my standards here, but you know, I'm not going to quite get there. That's something that I can, I can do, that I can handle as a parent. I want you to walk across this room. If you bump into three or four of those chairs, okay, you're a kid. I guess it's the reverse for our community. You're talking about how to increase motivation, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how to decrease. We have some really overachieving, yep. high-strung kids that I would love to hear you think with us about how to promote down and um, getting them to school is an issue with getting them to bed at night. Yep. Um, and how to kind of really kind of beef that up, like the priorities are fun. Okay, great, wait, 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 question. This is my, my third presentation today, so I'm starting my voice. My uh, Chicago Louise comes out before I talk. Let's break it down into a couple parts. How do we demotivate them? That's one question. And you ask something else. How do we structure their lives so they're doing, as parents, what we know they need to do best, like go to bed? I think there's two separate questions. The demotivation, I don't know if I like that word, but I know what you're getting at. How do we how do we slow them down? Fast. Yeah. We we need we need to lead the way. One of the ways in which we need to lead the way is by our affirmations, the way we talk at home, the way we relax, and the way we let them go. The way, there's where the boundaries come in. You know, we might just let them go, and we're not pushing them, we're not pushing them. It's the same thing as me sitting on the living room floor with my son and saying, okay, let's see what we did wrong. Not, Oh my God, oh my God, now let's talk about your GPA and, and what does that do with your average? Let's, let's figure out where your average is right now. See the difference? That is putting pressure on you. Rather than, hey, let's figure out what's going on here. And you know, the other thing I did ever since that, that moment is I always come home, much to my chagrin, this may be a surprise to you. But much to my chagrin, I hit the door, tired, hungry, and go, what kind of homework we got tonight? What do we got? This, I, I enjoy doing this. It's fun. And when I didn't quite get it right, again, it wasn't, <clears throat> that's how we can do it. It's our attitude, how we talk. But, but now, I, think, I think what she's saying, and I think we all know that's the second half of the question. Bear with me. So I'm going to answer that. This is where they need our guidance. You know what, Jimmy? 10 o'clock is your bedtime. You're going to put everything away at 10 o'clock. We need to 
structure them and teach them that these are the boundaries you put in, okay? And it, it's going to be some doing, too. It's going to be literally teaching. No human being can work on four hours of sleep at their optimum. So I'm telling you as a parent, 10 o'clock is bedtime, you put that away. But, 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 I'll never get this stuff. We'll figure that out. I'll sit on the living room floor and we'll figure that out. We'll figure out what's going wrong. But 10 o'clock is your bedtime. So that's the second half of her question. We need to set limits on our teenagers. Because going back to that one, this is all new for them. They don't know how to handle it. Can you do that with a 16-year-old, for example, who's going full throttle and is succeeding marvelously in the conventional sense? Because I know my 16-year-old will say, hey, Dad, good night. I'm going to do it my way. I've been straight A's and I don't need you to make a I think it's hard to put a 16-year-old to sleep Absolutely. If you have to, one, make your case, and two, you have to be insistent. You're the parent. This is a health issue. You know, this is a health, if they had a, God forbid, a disease or a sickness where you had to give them a pill at 10 o'clock every night, by golly, you do it. No matter what they protest or say. There's a little bit of departure, but I think it proves my point. We have terrible, terrible success with teenagers at what we call maintenance medications. Diabetic kids. <laughs> Kids with ADHD, true ADHD, a whole other topic, by the way, uh, et cetera, et cetera, taking their medications every day. Because the essence of adolescence and teenagers is, is independence and protesting. And I don't want I don't want to be dependent on this. At a certain point, you say as a parent, this is so important for you. You're gonna do it, little bugger. Or let's go back to the consequence chart. Or this is what's gonna same thing with sleep, same thing with everything we're talking about. At a certain point, you have to set the law down as a parent and say, this is what you do. But I can't sleep, I'm tossing and turning. We'll deal with that. There's things you can do to do it. But you have to, you have to parent, that's what we're here for, to parent and insist that these things be done. Yes, ma'am. probably have heard that it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution where there was not even a period of adolescence. I just heard a fascinating discussion on NPR. Uh, a guy wrote a book about the Revolutionary War. And this British soldier was uh, chronicled in this book. And he said, at seven years of age, I went to work in the coal mines in Great Britain. I joined the army at 14 because it offered me a better career and a better livelihood. And he fought the Revolutionary War first. We can have a period of adolescence. Adolescence is a period in which we experiment with adult wars, adult norms, how to be an adult, try things out, we fail, we can fail. Try other thing. Along with that, it's a period of separation from our parents, from school, elementary school, and middle school, which seems to be cooled together. The child goes into that experience and basically, I'm here. I'm here eight years. You get into high school, four years. At the end of your freshman year, you're thinking about college, you're preparing for college. Sophomore year, you're on that fast track, you're separated. Part of the separation process is independence. I want to do things on my own, mom and dad. 
I'm separating from you. I've got to experiment. I've got to try to be an adult on my own. That's part of the separation process. Same thing with privacy. Another issue that comes up with our teenagers is privacy, right? They don't want to be, you know, don't come into my room, lock the door, I need my privacy. What is that about? Very simple equation. They're learning how to be their own person. Privacy is very important. They have to have privacy. They have to try and, and experiment to be their own person. Very important. Give them privacy. Unless they don't deserve it, they haven't handled it. Remember titration? If you go into their room and they're doing something they're not supposed to, or they have something they're not supposed to, then they, they shouldn't get privacy. Mix those chemicals right. But if they're handling privacy, they have the door closed, you go in there, you inspect, you observe, everything seems to be fine. What's wrong with that? It helps them separate, it helps them to become an adult. The whole task of adolescence is how am I going to become a successful adult? That's it. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure that children that have to question. Isn't it true that children today, teens today, spend less and less time with adults? And that's exactly true. I should have saved one of the copies of my book because that's what family fit is all about. It's about using fitness and nutrition and health as a way to bring kids back into the family and bond. What a better, what a better equation when you're a teenager. Everybody wants to look good, feel good, to attract the opposite sex. Family fit is all about using fitness and nutrition to bring kids back in the family. Here's, this may be a little tangent to your question, because you're, you're absolutely right. Kids are spending less and less time integrating into families. They're all, one of the causes of that, they're also doing that. They're also in front of screens, isolating themselves from the family. So that's where I, and I've used this in my whole career to bring some of the most recalcitrant, the link one kids back in the families is fitness and health and nutrition. But here's a little corollary to what you're saying. Is that when we hit the teenage years, sometimes we as adults, as parents, we give up on integrating our kids into the family. We give up. They're into their friends, they're into their peers, you know. They're not going to go want to see uh, Disney's Fantasia with me like they did when they were six. You know, no, they're not. <laughs> but we need to think of how we can integrate in things that they're going to be interested in and want to do with us. My my scheme, my family fit is one way. There might be a hundred ways in which you can call your your child into an integration. Don't give up on being close with our kids. I remember what I started. My best friends to this day are my children. And all through their teenage years, we did things together. The biggest compliment I ever had as a parent, my daughter was about 16 or 17, was very social, and very much into the boys, and had a lot of boys after her, etc. And one Friday night, you know, we had kind of a family habit, we'd go out to dinner on a Friday night and go grab dinner. And she was supposedly to go out with her friends. And I observed her, overheard her over the front phone go to follow, say the following thing. Oh, uh, my mom and dad are going out here. I think I'm going to go with them. I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow the next day. What a great feeling. She preferred to go and be integrated with the family and in our habits. And the friends could come later. And I'm telling you, this was a very social girl. And just kind of think, yeah, that's pretty cool. Of course, she was getting a free meal, you know, and maybe at a nice place, but, but see what I'm saying? It can work. It doesn't have to be family fit, but think of ways in which you can bring that child into your life. And there's plenty of ways, but they're not going to be the ways that it was when they were in elementary school. You know, you got to reinvent stuff. Nor do you have to go to Justin Bieber concerts. You know, it's not about, I tell adults all the time, you don't 
They don't need another 50 plus year old friend. They got plenty of friends. They need their mom and dad. Great question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering in terms of when kids are in that transition from I to B, that the transition isn't an all at once sort of thing. They'll have times in their I, they'll have times in their B, and they'll be acting out of each of those. And I'm wondering if when they're crashing back and forth like that, how do we support that? What can we do to help them do that birthing process with the adults that are trying to become? I, I love that question because, again, that's the hallmark of being a teenager. In any given hour, they can flip flop between, I'm not old enough to take out the garbage, that's a big responsibility, you know, and shovel the snow, you know, I, you know, I can't do that. Hey, Dad, can I use the car? I'm not old enough. <laughs> They can flip-flop between being a tiny little child if they want. That's too hard for me. I can't do that too. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go cruising, you know, we're gonna go meet up and you know, we'll, uh, you know we'll have a Hartford court. And I can I borrow the car. <clears throat> Within an hour that happens. There's where our, we have to watch our expectations. We talked about the tattoo that he's literally got a tattoo across the wrist as patience. He he put there when he was a kid. He, he said he was tempted to put it. Tattoo on his wrist, patience when he's to, you know, to, to deal with his teenagers. It takes a lot of patience. And again, it takes structure. It takes setting boundaries. For example, look at my silly example about I'm too young to shovel the snow. Wow, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how to do that or cut the grass. I don't do them in the perfect lines that you want, you know. But oh, hey, hey, can I, can I take the car up? Here's what we need to do. Wow. You know, I called upon you a couple hours ago to do this responsibility, remember naming. And you couldn't do this. Now you want the responsibility of taking my car, my car that I paid for and, you know, is X amount of money and I can handle it? Hmm. Now which Jimmy is talking to me right now? You can do a little tongue in cheek sometimes. You know, like, hmm. That's an interesting dynamic, Jim. Now, maybe if you do cut that grass and do it the way I want, maybe you have a little bit of confidence that you can take my car and go to the Hartford Court and be with your friend. Boom. That's how I would handle it. You name and point out the difference in responsibility that the child is asking for and also shirking, <laughs> all in the same day. What are the scary Oh, there's so many. I'm noted for dealing with very violent kids. So, and I've been called on a lot of these national headline cases where kids are trying. I was not a part of the Newtown thing, but I was a consultant on Columbus. And uh, kids can do things because of how they're hurting inside that are very scary and very violent. And then sometimes they have no fear that because of a lot of things, which maybe a whole other night to talk about, they don't have some of the, the structures and boundaries like we have, that it's the socialization process that makes us a little afraid. You know, something's gonna happen, we're gonna get fun. They don't have fear there. Another, you asked a question about immaturity, and I could go on and on with the, the list. One of the other subcategories of immaturity is entitlement. There's a tremendous sense of entitlement with this group of young people, this, this population of young people. So fear sometimes is gone. Well, I'm, I'm immortal. Nothing's going to happen to me. You know? And that's scary because I see kids hurting other kids, hurting themselves. So the violence, the physical harm that can be done is extremely scary. And, and it's, it's real. Anything else? Could, could you comment on perfectionism, which I think is a close cousin to the next one? It seems to me it's a close cousin to being overly driven. You encounter that and 
Oh yeah, a lot of perfectionism, the result of perfectionism is stress. These kids stress themselves out with it. I can't make a mistake. And most of the time with those kids, I'm not going to look at anybody here, but most of the time with those kids, it's because their environment is affirming that's the way you got to be. I don't accept anything less. You gotta be perfect. You know, I don't accept, don't bring home that. Anybody read the New York Times magazine this week? Read, if you get a chance, read the interview with, uh, used to be the uh, superintendent of schools of uh, DC. You read, you read that? I like the quip, it's called. She brought home a C on a report card with a test, and she's Asian, and her mother said, we're not seasons. We're Asians. <laughs> <laughs> and she was describing in all seriousness. We're laughing. But she was describing the pressure that she was done. And um, you know, she talked about the stress that she was under and what that caused. So that perfectionism <clears throat> grinds away at our kids. That's why that read that I think that book is worth checking in into. That book about how our children succeed, you know, and that article about failure. Take a look at that. Think about it. Think about how you're putting that pressure on your children. And, you know, temper our message a little bit. Be permanent, be positive, and be patient. <laughs> exactly what you taught us. Be patient. Got standing, so I think that's about time. So, <laughs> thank you for your attention. I hope this is worthwhile. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, give you a little of my two cents about these issues. Thank you.